here in our, in our, in our TARDIS. In public television? And welcome to all of you and a very special evening at public television with Tom Baker, Sophie Aldred, I'm Charlotte Nichols with Todd Grimstead. And stay with us for the next hour. We will be asking all of the questions you ever wanted to know of these two wonderful actors. Tom and Sophie, welcome to Public TV. Thank you very much. <laughs> you look a little shell -shocked. No, 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 I'm ever so grateful. Yes, I really am grateful. <laughs> well, we have a, a bunch of questions from your public TV viewing audience. As you know, here in the United States, you have loyal fans of the Doctor. Does this surprise you a little bit? Yes, it does surprise me, yes, yes. Yes. It amazes me, because I had no idea there was this great following over here. And it's, so it's wonderful to see so many loyal fans. Now, where were you both born and raised? Let's start from the beginning. The very beginning. <laughs> well, I was born in uh, Greenwich in London, which you may have heard of because of Greenwich Mean Time, of course. And uh, raised in a place called Blackheath in South East London. And Tom? Uh, I, I was born in Liverpool, yeah, which is the northwest of England. Yeah. Yeah. It was a difficult birth, but, um, <laughs> but my, right. my mother was very understanding. My mother was there, naturally she was there. Most mothers are there, aren't they? Yes. <laughs> she was very good to me, aren't they? She didn't hold it against me. But apparently, uh, my mother was a good storyteller. I didn't know whether to believe my mother or not. The only thing I believed about my mother was that she loved me, which is the only important thing that matters. But she did tell me that I was born with all my teeth. <laughs> was she telling the truth? <laughs> well, I don't know. Well, she said that I had a crust with Marmite on it <laughs> within 20 minutes of my birth. <laughs> <laughs> and you still have those teeth today, I know, because I have seen you smile. Yes, right, I do have them. Yeah. You have a great smile, yeah, which I, you use I, quite I, frequently I... during the series. Well, if things please me, I smile. I might <laughs> smile a lot tonight. <laughs> I might do anything tonight. <laughs> how, did you, how did you get into being the doctor? How did I get into being the doctor? Well, it was one of those kind of happy accidents, really. I mean, I had nothing much to do with it. It, uh, it was the place was, the, was empty, and, uh, and somebody had seen me in a film uh, and thought it might be a very good idea to give someone like me, uh, the, the chance, and uh, that's how it happened, and I was out of work. Uh, I mean, like most of those things that happen in people's careers, it, it's just, we didn't know what was happening, it was just a job, and I thought, well, I might do it for a season, I didn't dream it would go on and on and on. Um, I didn't dream that uh, people would grow to love me, um, and so for a few years I was quite happy being loved. And then, of course, I got rather tired of being loved, <laughs> and, uh, and then I wanted to be adored. And, uh, and so they started to adore me, and I was ever so grateful. And then after a while, I sensed that they were getting a bit tired, and I didn't blame them, and so was I. And so I moved over and uh, let someone else have a go at it. But it was the happiest uh, time of my professional uh, career, was and it, certainly the loveliest job I ever had. Was it tough to move on? Um, it was... I think that nearly everything afterwards was a sort of anti-climax, really, because it had been such fun for so long, and I had been uh, the heroic leading character who always won. Um, um, and then, of course, when I left the program, I wasn't that character anymore, and people then just got to know Tom Baker and found Tom Baker really rather dreary because <laughs> I didn't win, and uh, I wasn't full of ideas. I was just you really know, like them, you know, pretty ordinary and rather timid. So, uh, and uh, I think that that has um, kind of sat on my career ever since because it's been 10 years now. It has. It has, yes. And you had one of the longest times as the doctor, though. Well, one of the longest. I don't think I was in it the longest altogether. I think that I did more than anybody else. I did uh, two series back to back, which was prodigious. And, uh, but then because it was new, I didn't feel that that was so prodigious. And therefore, I think in total I did 178. Uh, wow. Amazing, isn't it? That is. Sophie, does that sound like a lot at this point? Well, I've done 31, I think, <laughs> so, I mean, that's just nothing. Well, I mean, it's more than half your life, Sophie. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know about that. <laughs> well, I think maybe more than half your life, but it was a, it was a fierce sort of schedule. But it was a pleasure to be doing it all the time. 
And that's why I stuck with it so long. I thought, why should I give up this lovely, uh, this lovely job that makes me so happy and that gives me this wonderful relationship with children? In those days, you see, it brought out the best in me. When I was playing the doctor, and I, I don't know what the other fellows uh, think about it, um, but it brought out the best in me, and that I suddenly, because I had an heroic job uh, of this benevolent alien, I became fond of children, uh, which was interesting, isn't it? Actually, I became fond of them, and they became fond of me, and I had this instant intimacy with them, and they'd knock on my door and ask me out to mm. play, or on the way to school, they'd shout, hello, doctor. And, um, well, you know, it really started nice. as a children's program, did it not, in England? Well, I mean, a lot of people have this. This point is mentioned a lot, and people say, well, no, it's not a children's program. And sometimes, on a station like this, you might talk about something else that the family watches. I think, really, you see, that good television, excellent television, is a participatory uh, experience among serious parents, isn't it? Parents who are a bit thoughtful and not too worn out want to be involved in what their children watch, because what their children watch is fascinating and part of the whole process, and therefore they share the program. So what initially may be conceived of as a children's program, if it's good television, will involve grannies. I mean, I, in the old days, when I was a lot younger, uh, I used to be a real sex symbol among uh, old grandmothers. <laughs> grandmothers used to adore me. And the reason why they adored me was because during the program, the children who would be frightened uh, would be sitting on, their, uh, on the grandmother's knee, and they, they got to handle them. So for that reason, uh, I was popular with grannies. Kept so the family So it's, it's entirely a, a whole a family thing. I mean, I'm... I like watching children watching things, don't you? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Uh, most of the time. I mean, you know, not all children. I mean, some children I quite like to strangle. <laughs> uh, it's like there are certain old ladies I'd like to strangle. Uh, but uh, but on, uh, on the whole, I quite like children. Uh, well, we have so many questions from mm -hmm. so many fans of Doctor Who and Sophie now of the fans following you as well. One of the questions that many people wanted to know was, uh, what were some of the other roles that you did before you came to the series? So, Sophie, what about you? I know you sort of fell into this, didn't you, literally? Yes, I was very lucky in that I'd never even been in a TV studio before, so it was all terribly new to me. I'd, um, I went to university and did a degree in drama, and when I left, it still hadn't put me off the idea of wanting to be an actress. And I went round the working men's clubs to get my equity card and singing, and then I went into children's theatre for a while. And I was just heading into musicals, in fact, when my agent got me this audition for three episodes of Doctor Who. And so I came down to London, I was working in Manchester at the time, and thought nothing of it, really. They wanted somebody who looked younger than they were and who could ride motorbikes. And uh, I learned to ride motorbikes about six years ago, so <laughs> off, I, uh, off I trotted to the BBC and had a, uh, a chat with the director. And then a couple of weeks later I came down and met John Nathan Turner, the producer, which I, I didn't think there was anything very strange in that because I didn't know how television worked. And I, when I went back to Manchester, the cast was saying to me, it's very strange, you haven't met the producer, it must, be, it must have a good chance of getting in there. And to my great surprise, um, backstage one night, halfway through the show, it was Fiddler on the Roof we were doing. I rang my agent and she said, well, y you've got the three episodes, but they might want you to continue as the assistant. And I couldn't believe it. I'd never even been in front of the camera before. So it was, it was like just a, a total dream. It was great. And I went, the very next scene in, in Fiddler on the Roof was this scene called the gossip scene. And, and it was, um, have you heard, have you heard? And the, the news had spread round backstage like wildfire and there was this little chorus member with a grin from ear to ear and, and the cast slapping me on the back. I think the audience must have wondered what on earth was going on. She's awfully excited tonight. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. And so that's really how I got the job. That's good, that's so that's good. really your first professional experience. Uh, well, no, I had been professional in, in children's theatre, which actually was my training ground, really. Uh, I, th children's theatre has become the kind of rep of the modern theatre world, because we don't have rep really now in the sense of the word that, that you go into a rep company and you're doing back-to-back -back plays and you're, you're getting your experience that way. Um, because for commercial reasons, it, it just doesn't really work that way anymore. But um, the children's theatre that I did really trained me up in, in and it's been a valuable experience in dealing with uh, children at conventions actually and, and, uh, <laughs> and things like that as well so that was my experience that was my first professional experience but then Doctor Who was actually my first television job. Well Tom you said you were unemployed at the time when you got the role 
had you done other acting jobs prior to to the doctor well yes i mean i got started very early really because there was something that happened uh called the second uh, the second world war <laughs> um and uh that played out a little bit in europe didn't it it did uh it, it ran for five years yes quite a lot of uh it ran every night for years and it caused uh, such havoc in liverpool that mm. school was suspended and therefore i got caught up at a very early age in kind of in what we would now call street theater which was in the shelters overnight uh, people singing and dancing and making their own entertainment to pass the nights you know um, and that's how i um, began to realize that uh, I had some tiny little capacity to please people. Um, and then I suppose it was confirmed later. I began then to be very interested in death uh, and go to lots of funerals. <laughs> Although I had never, by the way, stopped um, being uh, grateful to the Germans for bombing Liverpool since, you know, it kept me out of school. But when I got interested in death, I used to go to funerals a lot. I mean, sometimes two or three a day in the winter. So, yeah, I mean, nine funerals a week will be in a good week. You say November. This is in the days before penicillin, when life was so much more exciting uh, than it is now. In those days before penicillin, you got a, a nail in your shoe on a Saturday night at a dance, and you were dead and buried by Wednesday. Uh, <laughs> you know, it, simply life was just uh, more valuable because you didn't know the minute. Um, and it was at one of these funerals, oh, it was ever so cold, I remember. God, I remember. <laughs> And uh, I started to cry, or, you know, not only not to stop, but cry. The tears came down my face because of the uh, cold, and I'd had no breakfast. Because I was a Roman Catholic, yeah, things have changed. Roman Catholics had breakfast now. <laughs> um, but, and so after the funeral, you got paid about threepence, a tip, threepence, you know, might be a small coin like that. And the man who, whose mother was being buried, he squeezed my arm, and he gave me the equivalent of, of maybe a dollar, uh, half a crown or something, uh, an immense amount of money. And it was at that moment, so weak I am, mm -hmm. I've never entirely forgiven myself for this. I was corrupted in that <laughs> moment. And I suddenly realized, he thinks that I'm weeping because I'm sorry that his old mother, who was about 294, had died. And that's why he gave me more money than the others. Mm -hmm. So from then on, it was tears and snot all the way. <laughs> and uh, so I became a kind of professional mourner, while the other boys, who were much more ni who were nicer and more honest, you know, were getting small, uh, small coins like that. And that's how it all started. You knew there was a bit of the actor somewhere deep down. Well, I just knew that uh, if they wanted someone to cry or someone to <laughs> please them, I'd never go at this. Yes, that's what I thought. Anyway, I recall my first uh, meeting with Tom Baker was you playing Rescue many years ago. Yes. One of the heavies of all time. <laughs> yes, that's right. Yes, I really thought I'd arrived when I played that part. I really did believe the publicity, that I was going to win an award and all that kind of thing, you know. And uh, it was interesting. That film went nowhere, and neither did I. <laughs> uh, I was really back to oblivion with that. But it was interesting playing those sort of parts. I've always been interested in the in rather more extravagant parts. Uh, well, as you know, people don't really give me real people to play. I'm currently about to play a marsh wiggle at the BBC in the Silver Chair by C.S. Lewis. And somehow or other, I actually am more interested in Marsh Wiggles, or Mad Monks, or Oscar Wilde, or Long John Silver, or Parrots. I once played a dog in a show. He was called Clint. That was a disaster as well. <laughs> but, uh, so I'm interested, so I don't get off with human beings. I couldn't play policemen, or... I, could pl I played a pope once, <laughs> but I couldn't play a policeman or, Nobody you know, a judge or yeah. someone. I, I'm not interested in those guys. Nobody real. Nobody real, no. Nobody with only one heart. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What a horrible idea. <laughs> right, yes, Doctor Who had two hearts and was 700 years old. Somebody said, actually, rather bitchily, I must say, I just quite like that kind of sharp humor. Somebody said... Somebody said, yeah, Tom Baker's giving up Doctor Who, and he said, darling, he's beginning to look his age. Oh. <laughs> oh, 700 years old. Yeah. Well, if you, um, if you had the chance to change your career, one of the viewers wanted to know, would you change? I mean, would you leave acting now at this point, or is it too much a part of the fabric of your life? Well, I, know I couldn't uh, really concentrate on doing anything else. 
but um, I mean everyone, you know, to coin a ghastly cliche, everyone has to give a performance. Um, and, but actors are, are rather licensed to do that. We now live in an intensely theatrical society, don't we? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's very difficult now. Everyone is uh, much more self-confident than they were. People actually are very con uh, conscious of the theatricality. People are very familiar with television cameras, and, um, and they do a number all the time, don't they? Lots of people do that. Um, so, we, no, I can't imagine. We, we might else. be aware of the television cameras just a little bit here this evening, perhaps. Yes, I think mean, I'll be more aware of those telephones. <laughs> That's what I'm interested in. You see, what I like about why I'm glad to be here tonight is I really believe passionately in public broadcasting, and I really am very sympathetic towards the American system where you're so underfunded by the uh, federal government. But I think if... You, Actually, I'll donate a few dollars tonight to help stamp out commercial television. <laughs> <laughs> that's what we will take you up on that. <laughs> well, Sophie, how about you? I know you're new into this whole acting career, but uh, is this going to be your life now? Do you think you'll stay in it? I don't think I could have a proper job now. <laughs> <laughs> no, I... <laughs> um, Sylvester said to me uh, a few months ago, he said, I didn't become an actor to, to get up early in the morning. <laughs> And it, it's true that, I, I don't know, it's, I, I, I love the world of television and, and uh, theatre because it does mean you get to meet so many different people. I mean, for example, I get to come to America and, and appear on, on TV. I get the chance to meet all these interesting people and, and it's a wonderful career. I, I, I don't know whether, I don't know what I'd be. Maybe it's because I don't think I'd be much good at anything else, would I? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> what, what are you up to now? I know the show is in hiatus. Yes, well, I, I mean, I, I haven't really done Doctor Who since the beginning of August. So um, I've been doing a, a, a children's programme that I do for the BBC. And um, I did Pantomime at Christmas um, in Hull, which is in the north of England. I did Cinderella which was great fun and lots of singing, which I wanted to do more of. And um, I'm just about to do a, a theatre production when I get back for a, for a rep company. Having talked about uh, the non-existence of rep companies, mm. I'm actually joining one to do a production of a play called Daisy Pulls It Off. Which oh, is, uh, excellent. I'm, yes. I'm playing Daisy in that, which is it's a wonderful story, a sort of rip-roaring girl's own story about this sort of... Uh, hockey playing girls in about the 1920s and uh, and I play a girl called Daisy who comes from an elementary school background but she's trying to fight her way into these sort of toffs and snobs at the at the public school and uh, winning the hockey match and and um, what else do I do oh winning the poetry competition and at the end I find the, the school treasure at the end and find out that I'm an aristocrat after all so uh. <laughs> I think that your, has your role now as a song Doctor Who, has that put you in a position for getting better roles, uh, like this one that you're talking about? Do people um, know you now more in the UK? I, I don't really know, to be honest. I, I, I don't think so, because the, the funny thing about being in Doctor Who nowadays is that because uh, we're not really widely viewed, um, I have the advantage of saying, oh, I'm in Doctor Who, so everyone goes, oh, yes, I know Doctor Who, um, but I've never seen you in it, you know. Um, so it has its advantages and disadvantages because it means that um, I don't get the disadvantage of, of typecasting, but on the other hand, I get the advantage of, of being in a prestigious show um, where, which people people know and, and respect. Um, I really don't know if it affects. I mean, it certainly put me more in the public eye, which which is again uh, a double-edged thing, you know. Tom, you you sort of felt that you that you perhaps got typecast a little bit that it. It limited your roles after you left as the doctor? Yes. I think inevitably, if one has a huge success, and uh, in world terms, I was involved in a huge success. As I joined it, it wasn't me, of course. I just happened to come at a time, the techniques were improving, the scripts were good, the supporting actors were marvelous, the designs were sometimes amazing, and suddenly I was in a huge success. Well, and that's unlikely that I should be in anything so successful again. So inevitably, by association, I'm, you know, they say, oh, that's Tom Baker, yeah, in the Doctor Who. And of course, as most people who make television programs don't watch television and scarcely ever meet actors, they think actually, you know, that I'm still like that. They don't realize now 
but I'm a kind of irascible old man, uh, you know, who could play a kind of uh, child batterer or a producer molester or something like that. Because they still think of me as that. I have actually changed. Now, nobody recognizes me in the, in, in the street anymore for obvious reasons. But somehow or other, it nags at them, and I have no credibility with them. Because I, th I think it's because of Doctor Who. There is, of course, the possibility that there is another reason. <laughs> <laughs> Which I will not go into, because it's too frightening to think about. Not true. Not true. <laughs> All right, yeah. But isn't it extraordinary how producers and directors can do that, you know, that can typecast you for so long in, in that role? But I don't think in television there are very few... I think that there are very few people in television who are allowed... Uh, who are allowed any kind of wide-ranging, you're very swiftly categorized. Yes. And you say, you know, you get this integrating middle-aged stockbroker type public school education, and they get X, and that's what he does very well. And when I know X, because I might have been at the National Theatre with him, and think, you know, he can do lots of other things. Now, with Tom, they say, you, you know, he's a bit, he's not very well in the head, but get Tom, they say. <laughs> you know, ah, or whatever, as if we can't do anything else. Now, this, of course, applies to absolutely everyone. I don't think this is so in uh, just in acting i think in all commerce and politics people get uh, swiftly classified i mean look at your vice president mr <laughs> quayle he is already typecast isn't he uh you know it, this innocent man gets this good part and um i don't know who writes the script for him <laughs> but there he is you know just because he's you know perhaps not the wisest man in the world he's no solomon and the poor man is mocked at Ah, uh, and there he is, absolutely typecast as a kind of buffoon, as if he's got, you know, he couldn't spell idea, never mind, have one. And there's an example, isn't there? You see, he's typecast. He will never escape that, will he? The Americans won't let him. Much to my pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> Tom, one of the biggest questions we had a lot of people ask, would you be in another doctor, like a Doctor Who special, the five doctors, or yeah. three doctors, or... If someone, uh, if they wooed me, yes. I mean, I, I think I'm quite easily won over that people will take the trouble to woo me. Uh, if someone rings me up and says, do you want to play Uncle Vanya, Tom, and I say, that'd be marvelous. I've often wanted to play Uncle Vanya or Gaius in the Cherry Orchard or something like that. You know, let's, when do we start? And they say, tomorrow. You know, I feel, well, I don't want to work for people who want me tomorrow. I have to be courted <laughs> because I, underneath this great craggy coarse exterior. I'm a rather delicate sort of chap. And I need lots of attention and lots of wooing and lots of applause and lots of smiling. Just like you, really. Mm -hmm. Just well, like everybody. All, yeah. Don't we all? And speaking of applause, it is really time for our viewers now to show their applause for Doctor Who. And Tom had the few words of support. And now we will take this moment to encourage you to support public television as well. Moving the phone to the...